Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to Saturday of seventh week here at the Oxford Union Smashing the Silos series. Now, this next event will be Catherine Tucker discussing privacy and innovation. Is there a trade off? A very timely discussion. Thank you very much for this. I want to begin by asking you, Catherine, um, about the conceptual questions. What do people mean by privacy, and why might there be a trade off between it and other goals like innovation? So there has been a quest amongst academics for the last 100 years to define what privacy is. And I think that quest is quite informative about where we are now. So we started off with an idea of privacy as being the right to be left alone. And that conceptualization came from the idea that there were certain celebrities who the equivalent of 19th century paparazzi would be pursuing and that they had a right to be left alone. Now, what's important though, is let's think about this a hundred years on. It's no longer the case that you have to be a celebrity, someone particularly important for data to be collected about you. Instead, every single person in the world, data is collected about them automatically, virtually, virtually costlessly. And so that transformation about what privacy may be starts to really inform the debate about the trade-off between privacy and innovation. Because in a world where much innovation is data-driven, evidently any time we put in place regulations to stop that flow of data, there's going to be an effect on innovation. And I have argued for over a decade now that really when we think about innovation policy, one of our big jobs is to manage that trade-off. And when people talk about um, the privacy paradox, um, when they, they say that there are kind of demands that people have for privacy, but that they may not also they may not always kind of put into effect in their personal actions, why might that be? And what do you think about the so-called privacy paradox? Well, I think the privacy paradox is incredibly important for understanding why getting privacy regulation right is so hard. And I'll tell you a little bit about my academic research on this topic. So what we did was we were running an experiment where we were actually giving MIT undergraduates a crypto wallet. And we gave um, and as part of this, uh, for half of them, we asked them actually their friends' email addresses. Now, our MIT undergraduates did us proud at this point. And uh, when we asked them the email addresses, they replied with false email addresses. Uh, sometimes the false email addresses had expletives in them. They were just not giving us data. But the other half of the MIT undergraduates, we offered them a cheese pizza uh, in exchange for this task. And at that point, we stopped getting the insults, we stopped getting the phony email addresses, people started to give over their privacy. Now, what's important about this is I think people often uh, conceptualize privacy regulation as being something to protect people who don't know what they're doing. However, let's be clear, these are MIT undergraduates, I'm partial. I know we probably have a lot of Oxford devotees on this, but you know, I think we have the best undergraduates in the world and they're incredibly well informed about data and computer science and they still behaved like this. And indeed, when you looked at the shift, the shift was actually being driven by our real computer science majors, the people who really expressed the strongest preference for privacy when we asked them a questionnaire. They were the ones who changed their behavior. And this for me just shows why getting privacy regulation right is so hard. You know, I've presented this research uh, to the US Congress and what was amazing about it were the two different responses we got. Like, it was surprising, not, it's not usual that they're both sides of the aisle of your research, but for the Democrats, they were like, gosh, if MIT undergraduates behave like this, we really need to protect everyone. Um, and on the other hand, the Republican side of the aisle, they were like, well, look, this just shows that you can't use surveys to impose more regulation. So the privacy paradox is basically an input into this trade-off between privacy regulation and innovation. In that obviously 
we like data-driven innovation. It's brought huge benefits to us. And then we're trying to do regulation when it's hard to know how to do regulation when you can't really know how to pass what people are saying they actually care about when you're where, in terms of the privacy regulation you're trying to set. Do you think when people um, make decisions about privacy, if they have to decide something up front, kind of before they're in the moment, do you think or do you see a difference between their behaviour um, compared to if they have to decide kind of in a spur of the moment where, you know, the reward is right there in front of them, but, you know, the, the cost or the, the benefit of, of kind of having better privacy is something that's further away and, and much less tangible? Right, such an interesting question. Um, so this is what I'd say, actually, the major, major driver of privacy protective behaviour we see is not really how much information or time for reflection you have. Instead, it's really boring things such as what we call navigation costs. So if it's hard and you have to click a lot of times on the website, seek it out, that's the real driver of whether people take privacy protective choices, not, not anything else. Now, the one thing I'd say about time, which we have found is I think your question was sort of thinking of a world where, you know, I've got a 24 hour cooling off period or something like that. That's not what we find in the data. The most important time dimension of privacy is how people's privacy preferences change over time. So you see, you know, you hear a lot of older people say, oh, young people today, they just don't care about their privacy. They're putting all their data out there. You know, don't they see how bad it is? But that's not the right way of conceptualizing it. It's not anything to do with people who were born uh, after 2000. Instead, what our data shows is that young people always don't care about their privacy. Uh, all those 40 and 50 year olds, if they'd had Facebook in the 1980s and 90s, they'd have just posted as much data. It was just more costly to do so, so they didn't. So I think there is a large question in privacy policy that how do you deal with the fact that people's privacy preferences evolve over time, given that data lives forever? So I'll just explain where this, 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 this sort of came from. We've got a long, long decades and decades surveys about people's behavior about refusing questions which might be slightly intrusive when you're answering surveys. So that's how we know there's this real cohort effect and that your privacy preferences change somewhere about 28. But what do we do about that 18 year old who's got a certain set of privacy preferences? And we can probably predict that in 10 years time, they'll have a different set of privacy preferences, but the data they're creating today is going to persist because that's the nature of digital data. So, um, that was a long answer, but it was such an interesting question. Well, it, it, it kind of um, makes me, it, it, it's related to my next kind of question, which is you talked a lot about privacy regulation. And um, I wonder, do you think that kind of market forces are driving, um, for example, I mean, when I think about Apple's main selling point on, on in many respects for the iPhone is the privacy. And um, do you perceive that there's an increased sort of desire among consumers, um, even if not in the moment, but in general for um, more privacy protective services. And on the other hand, if not, why is it that in some services we do see privacy being provided as a selling point like, like the iPhone, whereas for, for example, search engines, um, the, the main privacy kind of pro-privacy search engine dot, dot, go seems to be quite unpopular. So this is, you know, really interesting. Um, and you know, what, what can we say about this? So I'll say, I'll say a few things because it's such, I've written so much on the topic. I'm like, why do I start? So the first thing I would say is that when I present my research and I document empirically that this trade-off between privacy competition and uh, privacy and competition policy, then there's always someone on the panel who is saying, oh, well, you know, what happens if customers really care about privacy and actually the, the key 
uh, that, that that caring about privacy is going to really sort of solve the problem mm -hmm. because, you know, we, we don't have to worry if customers care about privacy. Now, what I'd say about that is, you know, we just have, I would say, lots of lingering failures along the way of that conceptualization, but I'm going to give you the one bright light I've ever seen in my research. Now, the, uh, you know, typical failure, Google Plus. It's hard to remember that. But think about everything that Google Plus had going for it, right? Large search engine, presumably a lot of data, a lot of, uh, lot of accounts. It should have worked. It was offering you know, better privacy protections or more control than Facebook was at the time. Just no one adopted it. No one, you know, they thought privacy would be a differentiator. It just didn't work uh, in that arena. Um, so we've sort of got the world littered with failures like this, where we haven't seen privacy preferences really sort of uh, lead to the kind of privacy competition that people hope for, which will get us out of that trade-off. Mm. Now, let me tell you the one bright light. And the one bright light, which can actually, I think, help us understand some of the Apple, um, uh, the Apple story, is that the once time we really sort of seen privacy competition work or people start to behave in a way which is more consistent with what they say their privacy preferences is when it comes to privacy against the government. Mm -hmm. The only time I've actually documented people really react to privacy re revelations is actually after the Snowden revelations where we saw a change of behavior, especially in Europe, in how people were using search engines and whether they were using potentially embarrassing search terms. Huh. And simply, if you sort of think, you know, if you think about it that way, then it starts to make sense, right? You know, privacy, when it comes to, you know, many areas of privacy, commercial privacy, probably just doesn't convey quite the risks that would lead some kind of privacy calculus to make important and product decisions. But on the other hand, privacy in the government and the, you know, the potential for um, government surveillance, well, that can be actually a driver. Now, I'm not sure if that's quite what a competition uh, authority is thinking about when they are thinking about um, privacy competition. But gosh, it's, um, uh, you know, it's the one compelling thing I've ever found in the data. Interesting. I want to I want to move us on to um, advertising and in particular um, the difference between basically what the shift to online advertising has meant um, and particularly the shift to targeted um, and or, or some people call it personalized advertising and I know you've written about targeting but also about measurement and about the importance of measurement in advertising and as a as we kind of think about the trade-offs um, it's kind of interesting to me to, to hear about, you know, what you think the benefits of these sorts of approaches are. And, um, you know, it, if we are losing something by having increased privacy, what it, what it is that we might be losing. Well, this is so interesting. And, you know, one thing I just want for the rest of the audience who's not just lived this for the past few decades. One thing which is slightly strange when you think about the privacy debate is it's been lived out in online advertising. Now, why do I say that's slightly strange? Well, it's slightly strange because if you're thinking about, you know, privacy risks, security risks, all of the associated things you might worry about mass data collection, you know, advertising is not the obvious place to go. You know, I'd be going somewhere like education or health where you can really make, gosh, this could be a privacy harm here. So everything's taken place in advertising and the debate is I think often viewed uh, through that lens. So I just want to set that aside, but now I'm going to tell you a little bit about my research, which is that for now 15 years I've been arguing that when we have the debate about data in advertising, we're getting it all wrong. Now, and why do I say that? Well, if you look at any of the long right papers written or uh, statements made by, by competition policy officials, when they talk about data in digital advertising, they're always talking about targeting. They're always talking about the fact that if you look up a certain pair of shoes, that shoes may follow you around the internet, something like that, extreme forms of personalized advertising. But really, that's not where the revolution is. 
in digital advertising, yes, it's nice to have targeting. We've had targeting for many years in the forms of using content for targeting, even in the analog world. But the digital environment make, makes it certainly a lot more efficient. But I would argue the real revolution is not in targeting. Instead, it's in measurement. And let's be clear, when you say measurement, it's just so much less sexy than targeting. You can see why <laughs> no one's talking about it. Well, honestly, you know, think about what the big problem is with advertising. The big problem is, is that we really have no idea what's going to work, how much we should spend. It's such an area of business decision-making where there's so much uncertainty. And so therefore, even being able to induce, introduce imperfect measurement and better measurement is just having a revolution in how firms are able to deploy their advertising dollars and make it efficient. And when you try and actually measure where the benefits to firms or the benefits of innovation in digital advertising are coming from, you know, I'm so sorry to say, but targeting is a bit of a sideshow. The real benefits are coming from measuring and finally having an idea that if I show Sam an ad, did that ad work? Did I, Sam do anything? Did Sam actually even see the ad? These questions we've never actually known the answers to before. So do you think that that means that um, what seems like a kind of really difficult trade off between privacy and let's say targeted advertising misses the misses the point and there isn't a trade off or or does the privacy point still bite when it comes to measurement as well? It's such an interesting question. Um, I keep on saying that, but you are asking really great questions. So I think the problem is, is that, you know, whenever we're trying to do regulation, because we have in mind targeting as the big privacy danger, lots of regulation is focused on that. And so much of the survey evidence we use to inform regulation is about targeting. I've seen hardly anything ever done on the question of how consumers feel about measurement. Mm -hmm. But measurement is still part and parcel of the same digital tracking system, which goes into targeting and can be endangered by the same regulations that are designed to deal with targeting. And so my biggest concern is that we can, because we're worried about targeting, deal with that, but take away this measurement revolution. Hmm. It's not so clear that that's actually what we're worried about as a society. Yeah, I mean, it does make me think that I've very seldom heard about a kind of hierarchy of privacy um, or a way of sort of weighing what what matters least to me, what kind of privacy matters least to me, rather than thinking of it as a kind of absolute yes or no thing. Because, um, you know, for example, Clubhouse is this new app that um, is kind of like a live podcast. Um, we, you know, next year we might be doing this on, on Clubhouse, let's say. Um, and one of the things that seems to have helped with it take off is that it's really easy to share your contact book with it. And you can see people who you know, have seven friends on Clubhouse and you can kind of think, well, I'm more likely to invite her or I'm more likely to invite this person because you know, they've they, they, they sort of got a network to plug into. But I believe that's quite controversial in terms of privacy um, and perhaps even uh, illegal in some uh, jurisdictions. I, I, I'm not sure. But I kind of wonder, you know, are there things that if we forego privacy in that way, the benefits in terms of measurement, as you say, or the benefits in terms of allowing new services to find users like that um, might be kind of, that's where we can strike the balance. Do you, are you aware of any work or is there any work that tries to do that? So you're right, this is just not how the debate is ever cast. And of course, because I'm an economist, and economists believe in trade-offs and they believe that there are levels of harm rather than a zero one conceptualization of harm. You know, I've tried to popularize an approach to thinking about, well, what kind of data should we really care about? And if you, I could go through that if that's of interest. Please. Oh, all right, so uh, having had my invitation, you know, what I do is um, in this paper, I make a distinction between two types of data, cookie measurement data, which is, let's imagine, this is like after Sam sees an ad, does Sam buy something? And I contrast that with a type of data where I think there really are huge privacy implications, 
such as your genetic data or the results of it, um, you know, going through your genome and actually trying to understand what your underlying DNA is. Now, why do I say that this is a useful distinction? Well, let's think about, well, what are the consequences of this data being released into the world for you? I'd say the tracking data, probably not so much. On the other hand, your genetic code, especially if you had a predisposition to uh, underlying debilitating illness, dramatically bad. Another question, persistence. And I think persistence is not enough in our debate. You know, if Sam, when he was young, saw an ad, didn't buy anything, is that going to have implications for him aged 50? No. On the other hand, if we release your genetic code, that's still going to be out there persisting exactly the same 20 years from now. So first criteria value, second criteria persistence, and the third criteria is going to be spillovers. And I think that's coming, you know, a, so it gets close to your ideas of sort of sharing contacts. In that one issue we don't grapple well with privacy is well, what happens if the data I release has implications for other people? Mm -hmm. And so if we release your genetic code, well, in some sense, that's going to have implications for any brothers and sisters and children you have, right? And so I always think these sort of three ways of thinking about what's the level of harm we should be worrying about direct impact, persistence, spillovers, is a useful way of starting to say, well, what data should we be really trying to protect with privacy regulation? And what data is potentially something which where we might be more willing to take the trade-off of innovation? That actually brings me to the, to the question of data breaches. And um, I think so far we have um, talked about kind of privacy within or and, 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 P and user data in the best case scenario where um, everybody's acting legally, everybody's acting kind of responsibly and competently. Um, how important do you think or how worried should people be about data breaches, especially for sensitive things like medical records or your genetic code? Um, is this something that is kind of basically when, whenever it happens in the few cases we, we hear about it and so we're kind of aware? Or is this something that's sort of always going on in the background that it needs to be a sort of permanent, persistent factor in the privacy debate. So the first thing I'll say is that it's so good you're drawing the distinction between security and privacy, because when we muddle those two, that's I find when we often the regulatory decision goes off the rails, because lots of times when people are asking or wanting privacy regulation, what they're really wanting is data security regulation, <coughs> to protect themselves from the kind of bad actors we'd see in a security breach. Mm -hmm. Now, the only useful thing I have to say, so that's the first important thing. I'd say that the framework I just laid out of these three considerations, size of effect or implications for you if the data gets out, um, how persistent it is, that's a really important question of data breaches, mm -hmm. and how much um, how much spillovers there may be for people who are not involved with data breaches. They should still inform our policy to data breaches. But I do believe that privacy policy needs to distinguish between privacy, which is restricting, um, you might think of it as generally geared towards restricting uh, interactions with well-intentioned actors, or at least actors who are not intended to pay for legally, versus that outside actor um, who's you know definitely there to, for, for purposes of criminal wrongdoing, and I think that's a distinction that's often lost in the privacy debate. I see. Well, if we if we stay on the kind of topic of medicine, um, I know you've written about electronic medical records, and um, more broadly, what do you think we're missing out on? I, you know, we've we've we focused a lot on the privacy side of this, and the innovation side um, is sort of the. It's, it's there, but you know, with the privacy has been the focus so far, but kind of interested in, in a world, let's say, um, a, a dystopia, we might say, of zero privacy, um, what would the benefits of that be? And um, do you think that there's a kind of a movement towards a sort of middle ground between getting those benefits without sacrificing the things that are really important to us? Or are we just stuck in a permanent state where we can either have one or we can have the other? All right, so I'm... I'm glad you brought up my work on 
electronic medical records, because I think it sort of shows that sharp, sharp contrast between innovation and privacy quite well. So one of the things I investigated was how privacy regulations in the US and the fact they differ across states affected how well hospitals, intensive care units for premature babies were able to uh, operate. And there's just a very uncomfortable result in it, which is that when you have privacy regulation, that leads to you know, less babies um, being able to thrive in these units. So gosh, the contrast is starkly there. I think the one bright side of this, um, of this, this body of work though, that I've done in healthcare, is, you know, we talk about privacy regulations, it's always the same thing. But what I document instead is that different types of privacy regulation have different effects on innovation. The worst one you can have for innovation in my research is the sort of informed consent, where basically you give people a whole list, you know, of things that may happen. That's very off-putting and particularly seems to penalize smaller entrepreneurial startups. Now contrast with that with a privacy regulation focused on control, but rather than just telling people about all the bad things that may happen to their data, you also put an element of control, an element of being able to stop disclosure, and then that can have a positive effect. And so I would say perhaps that's the way out of this innovation privacy trade-off. Rather than thinking of it as a trade-off, let's try and think about well, what regulations can we have which maximize privacy well, reducing these costs of on innovation, because not all privacy regulation is, is the same empirically. Well, that, that actually brings me to basically my final question, which is, do you think there are any jurisdictions in the world that are doing this well? Um, obviously, the GDPR in Europe is the one that we all know about and that we all, inter every, well, most people watching who are in the UK will be used to now dealing with a lot of GDPR provisions. Are there any other, first of all, um, do you think that there are um, ways of improving that? I know even the kind of father of the GDPR has said that he doesn't think it's suited to the world that we live in now four years ago, four years after it was introduced. Um, and are there any jurisdictions that are either bringing forward privacy re re legislation that you think does um, strike this balance a little bit better? Or do you think um, it's it's kind of down to people like you to convince at least one, at least one uh, body before, before we can see any hope? I'll tell you, you it's, it's always an oddity because it's so piecemeal. And, you know, this is what I would say. I would say that some of the worst effects we've seen, and, and this is not me, this is other researchers, so people who've looked at GDPR and its effects on innovation and entrepreneurship, you know, there were negative, substantial negative effects. And in some sense, that's because because it's a one-size-fits-all regulation, which is trying to impose the same regime on all types of data. Now, if we contrast that with, say, a state, and this is going to surprise you, Alaska, which has taken a surprisingly piecemeal effect, right? There's some kinds of health data, for example, it really protects, gives a lot of controls over some, it does less on. Now, it sort of goes against your regulatory urge as a regulator because you want data, you want regulation to in some sense be all encompassing and try and deal with all circumstances at once. But I, you know, given where we are now and given that, as you say, technology moves so swiftly, at least in my research, a piecemeal, sectorial specific types of regulation, which are really trying to adjust for well, really how bad are the consequences of this data getting out appear to be most successful in managing this trade-off. Hmm. So um, north to the future in Alaska, as they say. <laughs> um, that's pretty much all we have time for. If there's anything you'd like to add before we wrap up, um, it's been really fascinating speaking with you. And I just wondered if you had any final thoughts you'd like to leave us with. Yes, I'm going to leave you, I'm going to take my last 30 seconds to also say, I think one thing that the COVID pandemic has really laid bare is that we have so much of a debate about privacy regulation and innovation, but we don't have enough of a debate about simple questions of digital access. And I continually worry 
that the more we focus on privacy regulation, the more we're ignoring, well, what are the implications on inequality in a world where the, the digitally privileged and those who aren't? And I think the pandemic slowed that bare. And I'd almost like to refocus a lot of our debate there. So I'll just end with that thought. Catherine Tucker, thank you very much.